All right, everybody. Jason is out sick today, so no live stream, but uh, light a little candle for him because he's not feeling great. There was, however, some crypto news that we couldn't miss out on. So I'm doing a solo show all about crypto. I know. I didn't see that coming either. Meta just announced that it will be taking a 47.5% creator fee on the platform, as in if you create digital goods on the Meta platform, you will pay Meta 47.5% of whatever you sell it for. And that is not a typo, nor did I misspeak. We will go through the arguments for and against this, but I think we can also assume this is a pretty big opening for mm -mm, Apple or Microsoft to come in with a smaller fee. And then some news, A16Z's head of crypto investing, Chris Dixon, is number one on the Forbes Midas list. That came out earlier this week. And then finally, Jason and I sat down with WorldCoin CEO Alex Blania to talk about his crypto project. You might have heard about WorldCoin. This is the organization that is scanning people's irises in exchange for free crypto with the intent to distribute a token to everyone in the world. There has been some controversy about this recently, but Alex was a great sport. We went super deep in the interview and it's a great crypto show. Stick with us. This Week in Startups is brought to you by Coda. Coda is the all-in-one doc for teams. If you've got a stack of niche workflow tools or if you're buried in docs and spreadsheets, Coda is the doc that brings it all together. Startups can get a $1,000 credit at coda.io slash twist. Odoo. Odoo is a fully customizable and fully integrated suite of business apps that lets you build and scale your stack as you build and scale your business. Your first app is free forever, and right now, Odoo is offering $1,000 off your first implementation pack at odoo.com slash twist. That's O-D-O-O dot com slash twist. And I trust capital. Did you know that you can invest in crypto through your retirement account? and still get the same tax advantages as a traditional IRA? Visit itrustcapital slash twist to start investing today. All right, let's do a little bit of news today, basically because it is an all crypto episode of This Week in Startups. And both of the news stories that I want to highlight today are related to making a bunch of money on crypto. First of all, there have been reports that Facebook will evidently be taking a 47.5% cut of all transactions in their Horizon Worlds metaverse. I think I saw this in Casey Newton's newsletter and also on CNET. Uh, NFT Twitter is, to put it mildly, pissed. But we do want to clarify a couple things about this. One, 47.5% of anything is a high fee. No doubt about it in the digital world. However, and this is important to note, Horizon Worlds creators won't actually be selling NFTs. Meta right now only lets people sell user-generated skins and animations, basically the kind of thing that you could buy in Fortnite. However, if you compare this to other NFT-enabled metaverses or even any other digital goods marketplace, it doesn't look great. Uh, and then when you look at NFTs, specifically Decentraland and Sandbox, which are both blockchain-based metaverses with NFTs, they charge creators 2.5% and 5% respectively. OpenSea takes a 2.5% cut of each transaction on its platform. CNET noted that many NFT creator take rates fluctuate between 2.5% and 7.5%. So again, a massive discrepancy. Apple, which has obviously gotten a ton of negative attention for its 30% app store fee, is still charging 17% less on those transactions than Facebook is. So here's a quick breakdown of Facebook's fees. For every item sold in Horizon Worlds, a 30% cut goes to Meta via the Oculus platform. And then 25% of the remaining 70% goes to the Meta App Store. So not only is it high, that all adds up to that 47.5%. It's super confusing on top of that. Punk6529, which is a popular crypto-focused anonymous account, tweeted the following. The future of work is giving Meta 47.5% of your salary, apparently. <laughs> okay, let's do a little bit of a reality check. The 47.5% number looks completely insane on paper. It is objectively very high. Apple's 30% app store fee also looks really, really high on paper. But Facebook, much like Apple, 
would argue the following, most likely. I don't think Facebook has responded, but we can assume that something they'd be likely to say includes the fact that the cost of manufacturing and selling Oculus headsets and also creating a fully immersive digital world is so expensive that it validates this much higher fee for using the platform. Last year, Facebook spent $10 billion on Reality Labs projects. That's the Oculus segment. And then according to The Verge, Facebook now has about 18,000 people working on Reality Labs. So spending a lot of money on this. The same goes for Apple getting over a billion iPhones into people's hands while creating this, what they call safe and secure version of an app store. And to be fair, it really is, right? The well-curated, highly secure app store did create an ecosystem in which developers could get paid for making apps, which had never happened before. In January of this year, Apple noted that 600 million people use the app store every week across 175 countries and that, quote, developers selling digital goods and services earn more than $260 billion since the app store launched in 2008. That is, uh, <laughs> side note, more revenue than Starbucks generated over that time period. So what these two big tech giants are saying is we're creating a platform that no one else has the scale and resource to create an insane investment in capital and time developing hardware, maintaining this app store, and then in Facebook's case, creating a digital world. On the other hand, these marketplaces like OpenSea that are charging two and a half percent take rates, for example, have a really, really low operating cost comparatively. Meta's platform also supports developers who are making money from selling apps that people actually use. We had Ryan Engel on the show in episode 1322. He's the founder and CEO of Golf Plus, which makes the Quest VR game called Pro Putt. He told Jason that he was happy to develop for Meta and pay the Meta Quest 30% take rate because they had real users paying real money. Meta uh, recently put out VR sales figures and the Quest marketplace has crossed over a billion dollars in all-time sales in February. 124 apps earned more than a million dollars in yearly revenue and eight earn more than $20 million with 350 plus total apps in the store. So all of that goes back to this sort of potential argument that without a marketplace to make money, no one would make any money. And so Meta is saying, we're giving you a chance to make money and we're taking, you know, our share. Um, Chamath, uh, you know him as an all investee, once shared an anecdote actually from Bill Gates saying a platform is when the economic value of everybody that uses it exceeds the value of the company that creates it, then it's a platform. So I guess we're headed in that direction. I wonder what you think. Have we convinced you with the devil's advocacy is 47 and a half percent a fair take rate given Facebook's tens of billions of dollar year uh, per year investment? Or will creators continue to mock it? I'm assuming given the little that we know about the NFT universe that they're going to continue to mock it, but I guess we'll see. Another quick note related to crypto, Forbes released its annual Midas list earlier of the best or most successful VCs in the world. And the number one venture capitalist, number one in the world for the first time was A16Z's Chris Dixon, you know the one who leads the A16Z crypto investment team. So all signs point to crypto being a winner. In early 2022, it was reported that Dixon was raising $4.5 billion for new A16Z funds on top of the $2.2 billion that A16Z crypto already raised in 2021. Dixon, of course, had a huge hit with Coinbase going public in 2021 and had invested in Every single Coinbase round is how committed he was to that company, and it paid off nicely. He was also an early investor in Oculus before it got acquired by Facebook. I'm sorry, Meta. So what does this all mean? I mean, I guess it means there's a lot of money to be made in various crypto projects right now. And again, like I've been saying, the people who understand it are the people who are in a position to make money from it right now. And yet there's still a lot of uncertainty about what it's all going to look like in the future. And that gets us into today's interview with WorldCoin CEO, Alex Blania. This is that crypto project that we've been talking about that's been scanning people's irises in exchange for free crypto and has run into more than a little bit of controversy as a result. We have a little bit of a good cop, bad cop situation with me and Jason. We get into it with Alex and he was a very good sport for coming on and explaining in his own words, what WorldCoin is trying to accomplish. So let's get to that interview. Enjoy. 
efficiency is one of the main components in startup success. Everybody knows this, and that's what Coda is all about. Coda is the all-in-one document for teams. Your text and tables live together in the same document, which helps any team collaborate more efficiently. They've got thousands of templates to work with, or you can repurpose templates published by some of their best innovators out there for yourself. Coda works out of the box and it's super customizable. So you can create a wiki or a knowledge hub for your team. You can onboard new hires quickly and you can adapt fast to major or minor changes in your business. And here is how we use Coda at This Week in Startups. My guy Presh made a beautiful upvoting system on Coda for questions and topics on Twist. So if you go to thisweekinstartups.com slash questions, you can submit a question for the show for an Ask Jason, Ask Molly segment, or you can tell us what topics you want to include in the show. How awesome is that? And of course, you can copy that template and use it for your podcast or for your internal Friday all hands meeting, et cetera, et cetera. Coda has an amazing program for startups to help them optimize and support all of your documents. Go to coda.io slash twist to get $1,000 in credits. I kid you not, $1,000 waiting for you at coda.io slash twist. Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Molly and I have a great guest today. Uh, we've been watching this crypto project for well over a year. I thought this was a fascinating idea. I said so on Twitter. And I am a crypto skeptic, but a friend of mine, Sam Altman, uh, is associated with the company in some way. We'll find out in a moment, but the company is WorldCoin. You can find them at worldcoin.org. And the founder is Alex Blania. And welcome to the program, Alex. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. Thanks for coming on. Now, obviously, in that year, since we everybody has been talking about WorldCoin, I, I think it's fair to say things have gotten pretty interesting. There's been a lot of press, maybe a lot more press than you would have liked. Alex is already cringing. <laughs> <laughs> tell well, us before, before we dive into sort of the, the controversy though, tell us about your vision. Like what is your intent for WorldCoin and what are you trying to build? I think a little bit of history kind of context about the project certainly helps here. So Sam back then had this very simple idea of what would happen if we could launch a token uh, by giving ownership in a token to really every person on earth simply for being a human, right? Like this would be a dramatic reset. It would dramatically accelerate the transition into, into crypto, would create this big network. Um, and that's exciting for many different ways. He certainly came at it from his UBI perspective back then, right? Uh, kind of UBI will have to make it work in the coming decades probably. And universal basic and income, Rol we should yes, clarify for correct. people who don't know. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. And even if Rolcoin cannot fully solve it, it can certainly be the infrastructure for that. So this was the very simple idea, launch a new token, give ownership in it to every human on Earth. We started thinking about it deeply and realized that the first fundamental problem we will have to solve to do this is what is called proof of unique humanness. And that's a different thing than identity. It is basically you can prove to a protocol that you are unique to the protocol without revealing your identity. And that would be a very powerful thing to do. So you can log in wherever you are. You can say, okay, I'm unique to this service, not only Rollcoin. Say I'm unique to that service. I've not used it before. That is a very critical thing to solve, especially for Rollcoin, because if we don't solve that, the system itself is not what is called civil resistant, meaning one person can claim if it's a malicious actor, multiple of those shares, founding shares in Rollcoin. And that can be thousands of them. So like the whole system would immediately break down. Right, So you really, really have to solve that. And it's a tough nut to crack. Uh, it really, really is much harder than it sounds initially because you really want to make it work everywhere. Uh, it should work from Norway to Africa uh, for, for truly everyone just for being a person. So that already so excludes many things. And it's a, it's a very complicated technical question as well. We will talk more about that, I guess. Or for so quite you a while. said the term is proof of humanness. We call it proof of personhood, like other people in, in the ecosystem call it. call it proof of unique humanness. So proof that you're a one of one human on the planet, as opposed Correct. to how crypto works today, proof that you're a wallet, proof that Correct. you've that this wallet exists in the world, which I could wake up today and make 10,000 of them with a bot, you know, it costs a little bit of money, I guess. Uh, so that means, how do you get proof of humanness, I guess, is the next Correct. card. And, and did you look at Correct. multiple concepts to doing this to get to the one that you chose? Um, oh, will yeah. you have others? Yeah. And so let's go into that because oh, that's yeah. where this idea, I think, in people's mind, yeah. 
starts to become like a James Bond villain concept, as opposed to what I obviously your intent is, which is to just give everybody participation in a global crypto project. So let's talk right. about how you got to the certain biometric you're using. Right. So as a, as a first kind of just to set the stage, building our own hardware, and I think you, you brought this up. So we, we came to the conclusion that we need to build our own hardware that basically uses biometrics plus what is called zero knowledge proofs in crypto um, to issue that proof. And we will talk more about that, what that actually means. But we obviously, in the beginning, we did not want to build our own hardware because when you're a small startup, this sounds like a crazy endeavor, right? So this was not at all what we, what we hoped the outcome would be. So basically, we looked in many different ways to, to solve the problem. And uh, well, it starts with the, with the fundamental ones like KYC. Um, it goes on to with like know you, your customer, yep. know your customer. So you basically call someone, you show them your passport, and there is a database with your passport and basically an, an API that connects the database to whatever service you're using. Well, looking deeply into that, if you really want to make it inclusive for everyone that just fundamentally doesn't work, because for many parts of the world, it just does not work. So we kind of excluded it quite quickly. Things like email addresses, phone numbers, all of those things, they are not Sybil resistant enough, so they would immediately break down. It's relatively easy to create multiple of them. And then there's another thing we look quite deeply into, which is called Web of Trust. So you basically try to analyze a network and you try to uh, allocate different trust vectors to everyone in the network and you you try to understand like who is actually a real person there versus a bot um almost like a kind of credit check sort of yeah i mean like basically every social network is doing that in their back end in, in some way like facebook has a big team uh, working on things like that there there's some crypto projects working on this but the tldr is it does not yet work at least there is no functional prototype on a large scale uh it's really hard to bootstrap which is i think the hardest problem you kind of need trusted seats what, what is it called like you need people that you can trust these are real people and they they can then start verifying each other so like if mm. i have your like passport, page rank your passport, is how you yeah, know, yeah, this started like correct. the new york yeah, yeah, times yeah. said i'm sorry google said hey the new york times right. nasa whitehouse.gov whatever they link to they're not going to link to something that is horrible right. so page rank 10 was these top sites page rank nine was the, who they linked to and so right. on and so on they created an algorithm for that so we get that and it, the zero knowledge proof for people who don't know is the ability for me to convey some information to you a counterparty on a transaction let's say some piece of information without giving you that piece of information in this case right. it's i'm jason calacanis and she's molly wood and we did a transaction she knows it's me i know it's her or um, I have the amount of money in my account to cover this transaction without sending her my bank balance, right? It's just a way right. to say the zero knowledge proof is you have zero knowledge of the underlying data, but you do know the answer to the question. Is that a good way to explain I think that? This is a brilliant way to explain it. I also really like the, the page rank analogy because that's very close to the original papers on this whole topic. So that's, that's a really good one. At the end of the day, though, you were like, none of that is good enough. We got to know this is it. good enough. And, um, Basically, there, but biometric is just a fundamental solution to that, right? Like if you just you 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 don't talk about specific problems, you just okay, you take something that makes a person unique, uh, like biologically, and you you use that as which kind is of a why proof passports that now are moving to that. When you go in and out of a right. country, they're they're checking your iris. Am I correct? In some instances, like not yeah. every country, but I think the um kind of a really good example to that is certainly Atar. So. In India, if you want to be part of the social welfare system, or actually, I, I think at this point, almost everything you, you want to do on a, on a national level, you do that with your Aadhaar card. So basically, the Indian government has realized at some point, okay, we have a big corruption problem. It's really hard for us to keep track of identities. So they rolled out what is called Aadhaar, and they used biometric um, methods to do that. But no zero knowledge proofs. So this is... Um, so this is occurring uh, in India today. They have a system is, called Aadhaar, yes. A-A-D-H-A-A-R. That's a 12 di digit unique identifier that's obtained and you have a card. It's sort of like your social security card, but it's linked to a biometric, correct? Correct. Correct. Yeah. They and they use, did this um, because they, people were trying to scam whatever welfare or whatever system correct. it was, food yeah. banks, whatever. Yeah. Got it. Biometrics are the solution. Biometrics and then you're like, the oh crap, we're in the hardware game. <laughs> right. But but actually, you're not fully there yet, because you can think about whatever, maybe we can use phones, maybe we can use like, um, already existing hardware, but then there comes another really tough one, 
which is all the systems you use in your daily life, uh, if it's Face ID, if it's the fingerprint sensor on your door, all of those things, they're basically a one-to-one -one comparison, right? So basically, your iPhone knows, okay, this is how JSON looks like. There's an embedding stored somewhere on that phone. JSON tries to log in again. New embedding is created compared to this one previous one. If that matches, you can use your phone and do whatever you want. For this whole proof of personhood or proof of unique humanness, however, you need to create a new embedding and compare it against everyone else before. So it's a one-to-n comparison. And those error rates basically explode. So uh, if you were to use a phone, a face ID, or, or similar technologies after 10 million people max, at, at least that's, that's what we calculated, um, you would reject everyone because you could not distinguish them anymore. There is just not enough information about everyone. That just makes like total a, sense. So it's, it's fine to use face ID to open your phone. The chances of it being confused right. are one in millions. But if right. your goal is to put 7 billion people on a global cryptocurrency, that means if it was one in every 10 million, you would have whatever that is, 100 every billion, you'd have thousands of mismatches. And that could be somebody's entire, that could be some catastrophic issue, correct? I, yeah, actually, actually, it, it's actually much worse than that, because it's not that um, you just continue to scale and you just whatever one one in a th one in a 10 million or something, you re reject them, but rather, after some scale, you just have to reject everyone because you cannot distinguish them at all anymore. Ah, got it. So it's even you basically just hit a wall. Basically, there was there was the other other big insight. And so we realized, okay, we really have to build our own hardware. And the only biometric identifier that really works on that scale is the iris. So the muscle of your eye uh, has a lot of uh, information in it. Entropy is how you call it, like mathematical information. And it. it's, it's non-invasive and it's, it's very kind of easy to image in that sense. So we realized, okay, that's, that's, the, that's the path to go down. And you cannot even use normal iris scanners for that. Uh, so we really had to build our own lens. We had to build our own Im imaging system to get to the resolution, a resolution we need. Um, so, so anyways, that was, that was the first big problem we really have to solve is, is this, this proof of personhood problem. And if you solve that and you have a unique token, you can really start rolling this out on a really large scale and you can build many, many other things in the future. Listen, when you start scaling quickly, your company needs to be run professionally. And Odoo is the software that helps you maintain control of your fast running business. Odoo suite of business apps let you run your entire company on one platform. This means you don't need to keep adding a bunch of different SaaS products. Everything you need is already on Odoo. All you have to do is turn it on when you're ready. Odoo has over 40 main apps and over 16,000 apps from their open source community. We're talking about sales, accounting, marketing automation, HR, website builders, and so much more. Plus, if you only need two or three apps to optimize your workflow, that's all you will pay for. Again, Odoo helps you streamline by running all your business apps on one platform. That means no more issues transferring data back and forth, and you'll have one customer support contact across all your apps, not 20. And the best part? Well, here's your call to action. Your first app is free forever. And Odoo is offering a $1,000 credit on your first implementation pack. Go to odoo.com slash twist for $1,000 off. That's O-D-O-O dot -O com slash twist. So did the normal iris scanners out there work or were they just didn't not high fidelity enough? Is that the issue? They do not have high, high enough resolution. Because uh, again, most of them are used in this other use case where you try to look right. into somewhere. It's trying to open your door. So right. it just needs to know right. that you're close enough to your door. Correct. Right. Right. So you made this device. Uh, tell us about the orb. We made this device. It's a really cool device at this point. It's a 20 centimeter sphere. It has a, a custom lens in there to, to make that, that image of your eye that is high enough resolution to make that comparison work. It has a lot of security sensors in there as well, because that's the other big problem you have to address. Right? Like one is just checking uniqueness. The other big problem is uh, people will attack the system as, as much as they can, because basically if you succeed with your attack, you can create multiple identities. You can get multiple of those tokens and you make money, right? So mm. it has a lot of hardware security features and what we also call presentation attack security features in there. So basically there are neural networks on that device that check that you are a real person, not a display um, or, or something, something else. And you've started to pilot these orbs. Where are you at with that? Um, I had heard that, that you know, like 100,000 people had their eye scanned already. I, I don't know if that's true or not, but I saw some headlines go by. Uh, how many orbs did you make? And then how many people have you scanned? 
Because I know the coin's not out yet, so you're kind of scanning right. people as a test or something, and then with the promise right, of future right. coins? Okay, so let, let's actually take a step back. I think it's important to understand, right? So there's a token and there's a there's this platform, basically. Proof of person that any, anyone else will be able to use, by the way. It's an open protocol. Uh, it's not only for the Rollcoin token. So you build a DeFi app, you can just use that Rollcoin login identity. So these are the two things that exist. Hmm. And for this proof of person, we build this orb. But this orb is not operated by us as a project or a company, but rather like from, from people all over the world that earn Rollcoin with every, every sign up they initiate. So it's a, a decentralized model. Um, and that turns out to work really well. Uh, it's, of course, really hard to, to, to kind of deal with all the edge cases because there will be many of them. But that's the general idea. So like Facebook and Connect. If a website wants to use LinkedIn login, Google login, Facebook login, Twitter login, if I make a website or bank or whatever, I could use WorldCoin's login. And yes, I could do that for free or I have to pay a couple of WorldCoin tokens or something to authenticate each person. What do, how does that yeah, work? Yeah, correct. Like, like this, this whole monetization we have not figured out yet because it, it will really depend on how people end up using it um, mm. in, in most instances. But, but that's in generally correct. So as a user, you receive basically two set of keys one for your token and one for your identity, your proof of personhood, uh, and, and everyone else, as you say, as Facebook login can just integrate that in their app, in their, in their product. And then probably, you're right, they will need to pay some Rollcoin to... Uh, to How many Rollcoins will there be? Did you... Say, it's going to be a trillion Rollcoins. It will be, you know, 100 per person, 700 trillion, or 1,000 per the, person. What, how are you thinking be, there about... Will be 10, there, there will be 10 billion tokens uh, ever created. So it's a capped supply system. And 10 billion 10 billion and you came right. to that number because that's in our lifetime how many humans will be around or something basically we we realized in the beginning we need around 20 percent of of the circulating supply to actually fund the whole operation and really mm -hmm. get it off the ground and then got you it. have eight eight billion left which is as, as many people are there got it so what wh when will the tokens launch and what will how will you price them initially or does a market Late just pick the, I, I mean, the market will just price them and we will launch them later this year. And this will be a, a big event to watch out for, for sure. Uh, are um, you selling those tokens in advance, the 20% to fund the project? Are you selling those to venture capitalists like Andreessen Horowitz, et cetera, who like to buy these tokens? Yes, that's correct. Uh, ha that's have you the, sold them yet? Um, I mean, it's it's actually equity rounds, right? So those, ah. those, those investors, they buy equity in an operating company and then later uh, they can choose to buy tokens as well. Got it. Oh, with a warrant, a token warrant. Got it. What That's what will you probably. put those tokens value at uh, for them at the start? Because this has been a point of contention, like, oh, the VCs get to get first shot at the tokens. That's not fair. Crypto is supposed to be fair. Uh, I, I don't know why people expect crypto to be different <laughs> than corporations. But um, what what will you price them at? If it's two bill, if you have 10 billion tokens, you're going to sell 2 billion to fund the project, or you just charge a dollar each and raise $2 billion, 10 cents I each mean, and raise 200 million? I mean, I, I cannot talk about the actual valuation right now, how we do that, but basically it's, it's, it, it's with a normal funding round, right? Investors look at technology, investors look at the data we have, and they try to think about the upside of this project. Got it. So I would guess, well, if it's a billion dollar company out of the gate, 200 million, if it's people value it at 10 billion, it'd be 2 billion. So between those two numbers, perhaps, uh, is where you wind up. And that will right. fund you going out and scanning all these people's uh, irises. And then how many tokens will they get they will get one token each is the idea and they'll be like one bitcoin essentially and then we'll see what a bitcoin is worth in the world and you reserve one per person for everybody on the planet so so two two important things here the first one is um the users they will not receive a one like one time token basically but rather you ah. receive a, a continuous flow over multiple years Got and it. we have not locked this in yet because we're still like it, it it really depends on on those testings we can talk about in a second but we have not locked this number in yet uh, so user, user, you sign up for Rollcoin and you know how many Rollcoin you will receive over the coming years. And then basically every week you get a small part of that. Got it. So if this were to be looked at like a Bitcoin, cause you're making one for each person, essentially, if it was a Bitcoin, they would get a hundredth of a Bitcoin a year. Maybe it increases when they're retired because they would need more money then could be one concept. I don't know how it could work. Maybe you get, you know, 50 basis points for your first 20 years on the planet. Or maybe if you're in a country where you needed the money because of prenatal or, yep. or like early stuff, maybe people in Africa who maybe need the money early for education, 
get 10% a year for or 5% a year for the first 20 years of their life, maybe in a developed economy, you get 50 basis points, and then you get the bulk of it at the end where retirement is the issue because it's an aging population. All of this would be amazing ideas. Um, in, in general, right now, it's it's really thought as this one one rule that is, is the same for uh, us. One so rule for everybody. This, yeah, mm -hmm. one, one, everyone will have the same unlock schedule. Jason Got hates that. Fair enough. <laughs> well, he wants no, a VIP I mean, option. No, it wasn't even VIP. I was actually thinking more, you know, there, the, what a person in Europe needs might be distinctly different than, you know, what a person with a shorter lifespan right. in Somalia needs. Like wherever the shortest lifespan is, giving them one, you know, one, two percent, giving them two percent a year where they, the lifespan might be under 50 in some places. Right. Like, that's not good. They need, they no, need course, early when they need to get education if they were going to spend it on such things. Right. O of course. But I think um, here it's actually really important to just state again that what Worldcoin does, it gives access to all of those people. Right? Mm -hmm. All of those people end up with fundamentally an identity and a wallet, and everyone else can access it too. So mm -hmm. even though that is the economics of the Rollcoin token, there might be other tokens that launch on the Rollcoin protocol ah. uh, with different economics to solve different problems. Oh, so, so it it oh. is really, really mm -hmm. like the first step to get this kick started. And, so the then world coins for identity, but then in a developing nation, if they were if they wanted to give UBI to a certain group of people, they could do like, what do they call those ERC 20 tokens or something off of right. Ethereum. So there'll be some sort of concept like that. Somalia or Italy could have a different token. Or yeah, India I mean, could even, have a different even token. You, even, that you, even you could, you will be able to launch the JSON token and give ah. that JSON token to every human on earth because you think wow. this is how it should be. Fascinating. Wow. Mm. Listen, pretty much everybody knows someone who has invested in crypto at this point, and lots of people have exposure to different tokens themselves. But did you know you can now invest in crypto through your retirement account? That's right. With iTrust Capital, you can buy and sell cryptocurrencies from your crypto IRA. This means you get the same incredible tax advantages of a traditional IRA, but you get to put cryptocurrencies in there if that's what you believe in and you believe that's going to be part of the future, which I do. iTrust Capital has over two dozen of the most popular cryptocurrencies to invest in. And unlike the stock market, you can buy and sell 24 hours a day if you want. The iTrust Capital platform is easy to use and only takes a few minutes to create your account. Setting up an IRA is free and iTrust fees are low. You get a free account and a 1% fee per crypto transaction. So here's your call to action. Visit itrust.capital slash twist to start investing today. That's itrust.capital slash twist. Disclosure, taxes and conditions may apply. Fees apply. Cryptocurrencies are a speculative investment with risk of loss. iTrust Capital Inc. does not provide legal investment or tax advice. Consult with a qualified legal investment or tax professional. Let's talk about some of the controversy that has arisen has arisen right has there been a controversy yeah <laughs> well, Can't, uh, couldn't expect that scanning <laughs> hundreds of thousands of people's scanning irises thousands and giving them free money viruses. would cause any kind of attention so, but <laughs> well one one question about the the giving them free money is that the token hasn't launched yet right so right. the 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 payment as such that people are receiving for having their irises scanned like talk, talk to me a little bit about the decision to build out the iris scanning first and then compensate people with a token that does not yet exist i mean for, first and foremost they actually will receive um something relatively soon but you really have to think about it in a way you you have a company you have a project that needs to build many many things at the same time mm -hmm. right so one is the technology it's a completely new hardware device that doesn't exist yet uh that itself is extremely complicated uh then you have a a growth mechanism that is distributed. So you have people all over the world that use that orb to, to basically verify other people, right? And there's many, many economic mechanisms around that to actually make that work and make it click and like how to set up the Q&A around this and all of those things. So this is, this itself is very complicated. And then of course you have, you have an app, you have a, a protocol, all of those different layers of technology you have to make work at the same time. So basically what happened in the last, in the last few months, is that we tested different parts of of those system in in different parts of the world for different reasons and we just we, we have been in a quick test testing mindset so the number of orbs has been quite low it has been a total of around 30 sometimes 40 of early prototypes and even those devices they change right because we we went up in iterations of those devices and then we just try to cover as many parts of the world as we can possibly do in the shortest amount of time 
and understand what works with different people, what, what is really, really hard concepts to get across and, and, and what is not, right? Like, how does the app need to look like? Or if you have, if you interface, I, I think the TLDR is in, in Norway, things work quite easy. But if you talk to people that have never heard about crypto and you need to explain them what is a private and public key first, uh, this has many applications of, on your product. So many, many things that, that have, to, have to be tested and have to be done right uh, in a short amount of time on a global scale. Right. And, and that is basically what happened. So, um, on, on the, the point you just raised, this was actually just one of those tests, right? For example, in Norway, you have different tests, very test of the app, uh, or, or things like that. And another important point is that we actually don't need that biometric data, uh, but rather does the optics work in sun or in snow? Like, does the, like all of those different things, you just, you, you cannot simulate that. Mm-hmm. So, of test. course, people so felt like. Yeah, it was just a test, right. but people yeah. felt like they were going to get coins, so maybe they just felt like they should have gotten them now. I mean, you could just give everybody a dollar for doing it, like just hand and them that, a dollar. And that is what, we will ha- will, what will happen basically in the coming, I think, three weeks. It's basically all of those people, they just receive some Ethereum uh, oh, great. And, and, some, and some other tokens, so whatever. In their they, wallet, if they figure in, out how in to log wallet, in. And they yeah. also will, of course, receive Rollcoin later on, and they even can claim Rollcoin again when it actually launches. So Great. They're, they're, they're the happy people in some sense. All right, sense. so let's talk about if privacy. they still have their wallet, to be fair. Several of them did well, no, report that get they their, lost but if access they, they to their did, wallets. Oh, but if they use their iris, can't they reset their they, wallet? They, they, yeah, they can just reset it, um, especially those people. Uh, mm. So that might be okay. tech because support of, issues, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Early stage tech support issues. So, okay, well, right. well let's, let's dive into the privacy issue. I give you this iris. You have my iris. It's encrypted somehow. What if you get hacked? Like this is, I guess, people's great concern. And then, yeah. So there's that. There's the pragmatic one of hacking, and then there's another one, which is, what are you telling people in the terms of service you will allow to happen with my iris? If the federal government says, or if India's government, or an authoritarian government, China's government says, or they subpoena you and say, give us these ten people's irises. We think they're terrorists. Right. Uh, and they're actually journalists. Are you going to give it to them? Can you give it we, to them? We we can't um, explain and, and that, technically why. So, yeah. So, so let's let's understand the basics because that is really important to get right. So so a few, a few statements up front. One is Rollcoin is in fact I think the most privacy preserving way to solve that problem to date. Like much more privacy preserving than anything you use your Facebook login, your Google login, all of those things. Uh, and I will explain in a second why. Second. Um, we really do not want to do anything with that biometric data. In fact, we're incentivized to stay as, as away from it as far as we can for obvious reasons, because that is not core of what we're doing. Core of what we're doing is we just want to solve that one problem and move on. Everything will be open source. So uh, there is, uh, we have clear aligned incentives in that direction. So let me talk now about the technology. Um, basically, what happens is you go, you show up in front of an orb. You want to be verified. You want to get your Vulcan account. The operator, which is the person using the orb, presses a button. Uh, 15 seconds later, you're basically verified and uh, you get your your account with your proof of personal and your, your Rollcoin tokens in there. What happens on the backbone, though, is on that orb, locally, there are many neural networks for many different reasons, uh, many of them for fraud detection, but let's talk about the identity part first. So Iris is imaged, a local hash is calculated out of, the, out of that Iris image. And what that, in, what that implies in the first case is you cannot go back from that iris hash to the actual iris image. So that's that's a one-way function. So it creates a mm-hmm. number. Hash is a fancy way of saying right. a long number mm-hmm. based on my number. eye and my iris. And then Correct. the number is unique, but you can't reverse engineer the number into an eyeball or an image Correct. of an eyeball. Yeah. Correct. So, and then that is the only biometric data about you that is leaving the orb. It is sent to also a blockchain, so not a central database, but another blockchain where it's compared against all the other people that have signed up before that. And then what happens on the user side of things on your phone is that the user is proving with a zero-knowledge proof uh, plus that blockchain that that user is included in that kind of uniqueness blockchain, right? Without revealing who the user actually is. So that means... Let's say we let's talk about the worst case. Even if I would have uh, Molly's Iris hash, I would have no idea what your actual account is on the Vulcan side. And the same is true for any other service. So whatever you log in in a DeFi app, 
uh, or you whatever, even a, a conventional service, that service will never know who you actually are, just that you are unique to that service. And that is a very, very powerful thing, I believe. Right. So it's so in, I a, a, in a, in yeah. a, I have a follow up question about that real quick related to like a right. lost wallet. Right. If it's all anonymized and all you have is this hash and you're just in this mess that says you have signed up once before and you go back and you're like, I lost my wallet, scan me again so I can prove I'm here. Isn't that not going to work? Because the idea is you can't be scanned more than twice, more than once, but also your right. identity is not connected to this hash. Right. Wallet reset does not work that way, but identity reset works that way. So you lose your um, wallet. So just like in crypto, you hear horror stories of people losing their wallet with five Bitcoin right. in it. That's on you. So you get this right. added security, but if you don't have your backup code or whatever to unlock the wallet, that's on you. So how so is the wallet secured? Who, right. So anybody who was scanned in these tests, who then, and you know, it seems like it, in some cases it was happening in countries where, and in places where people had very low familiarity well, they if can, they lost they can, their wallet. They can just sign up one, once more because we basically, I mean, these have just been tests, right? There is no oh, reason why, okay. we actually, why we actually store those hashes. So during the test, they can just sign up again. There's no coins in the wallet yeah. right now. But right. when the coins are in the wallet, the wallet would you be secured just, right. by two-factor, a password, whatever somebody chooses, like a standard right. email account. The same, right. You have, the same, you have the same procedure as you have of any other Ethereum wallet, basically. So if you lose it, it's on you if it's there's stuff you. in it. So all that the people sense. who have been scanned so far uh, are effectively like they're just training data, but they're sort of non-persons with respect to wanting to sign up again in the future? All of them will be able to sign up again once the actual mainnet launches. And that's important for many reasons, right? Like the product was not perfect in many different ways. Like many of them maybe uh, didn't understand it because all of those different reasons, right? So, But what were they compensated with? They They presumably were compensated with a token. So if they keep it, or some fraction thereof. Then they get more, and that's fine. Then they get that that token they get for this for this initial test sign up plus the one that actually happens yeah. when the main. So they get paid by. twice. They get paid twice, and that's fine. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I think it, there's also going to be expectation of, well, if I did this, do I get a forty thousand dollar Bitcoin? Like people's in people's minds, I think they're thinking Molly. <laughs> right. Well, right. I got one of these. I was one of the first people to sign up. Now it's going to go on a tear and it's going to become worth, you know, what Ethereum's worth. The fact is... I mean, what if it did and you just sort of happened to be... I mean, that is sort of interesting that just because you were in the test, then you can sign up twice. No one else on earth will be able to sign up twice except for these 500,000-ish people. And then yeah. if this token is eventually worth $10 million... They would be... Score! Yeah. Great I got score. Paid twice. Congrats. Congrats on getting oh. in early and being a beta tester. You know, you got an extra coin. I think it's cool. But I mean, the truth is, if there's 10 billion coins, the chance of these things, you know, being worth more than a dollar each is going to be low. I mean, it's it would take a the entire world, a, a, a large group of speculators would have to think this becomes the most important project in the world. And they just run up the tokens. There's just a there's right. a large supply of tokens is what I'm saying. I mean, it it takes quite some years to get a full supply, right? Because um, basically, every every user you sign up gets some broken tokens. So it takes seven ten years depending on how fast we are even can take longer like depending on how many how quickly we actually are with this onboarding i think it would take seven years if we sign up a billion people in less than two years after may not i mean bitcoin's going to be 20 million right or 21 million it's like it's capped at a certain number of bitcoins right. mm -hmm. i think it's yep. 20 or maybe it's 21 so here you're talking about a much bigger pool right so the idea that they would become worth thousands of dollars i think is you know, each is probably not what's going to happen here. But this could be a great identity system for people around the world to, to log in. Oh, to I think it, I think it actually could be much more right because there, there are many interesting things coming together here. Like one is, as you say, identity. But the other big thing is, you have this onboarding happening with those orbs all over the world. And they actually lead to very different networks. They lead to highly localized ones, right? Where mm. Usually crypto networks are like some people in, in a country or something sign up for a service versus for WorldCoin, uh, you will get to double digit like numbers of users in a certain location quite quickly, right? And if what we see in those tests and those numbers are very, very promising, we actually can get 2 billion people scale quite quickly. That, that's our big bet. What, are you, what countries it, do you think will benefit from this the most and which ones are you targeting to hit double digit percentages first? 
Is it the emerging world? Is it the modern world? Are you going to do this in actually, Barcelona? Like, are you going to do it in internally? Internally, Bali? like the simple, the, the simple idea is just make it as kind of equal distributed as we possibly can. And of course, this hits some walls because, like in in some places, it's harder regulatory wise or even kind of just raw uh, growth wise. But the general idea we have internally is make it accessible as as much as we can as quickly as we can. You're going to make fifty thousand of these devices. Is a year, a year, a, a year. It will be who it will gets be the more. devices, and are the devices like nodes where I can be like an entrepreneur? So if I got ten of these devices, I'm getting paid every time I put somebody on. Is there some sort of I don't want to say multi level marketing, but is there compensation for an individual? If Molly and I wanted to get one of these each and start scanning people at our farmers market and explaining the concept as evangelists, is that how you're going to distribute these? That that's that's exactly right. So you you receive those orbs. You send up people at a farmer's market, you explain what Rollcoin is about and why it, why it is exciting. And then mm. those users receive Rollcoin and you receive Rollcoin for every sign up you did, right? How many Rollcoins do I get for signing somebody up? Or undecided? That that actually depends on what, what the market price will be at the time because that ah. those operators, they have an opportunity cost, right? It's like one hour signing people up versus working somewhere. It, it needs to make sense for them. So hmm. there is What's a... What's happening with the operators now? It sounds like there's been some concern about operators who haven't, who did get paid in Worldcoin that doesn't exist yet, or who are concerned about whether or when they're going to get paid. No, no, no. All of them got paid. That that is very easy to answer. All of them got okay. paid in, in stable coins right now, right? Because they obviously they they spent time of their life to do this, and we just paid them in stable coins. Perfect. Um, uh, what you, are people? Go ahead, Mark. I mean, I, I are you surprised at some of these stories? Showing blowback. I mean, like, obviously, you have very well thought out technology based answers to all these questions. And yet, that's sort of not how the real world works. Like, were you surprised? I mean, when you show up with a creepy orb and start scanning eyeballs in developing nations, and people aren't quite sure why, and they, you know, think they got paid in a thing that doesn't exist yet. Like, did it surprise you that there was this con controversy? I think the part that surprised all of us is just how much, how much attention there would be to like a very, very early phase of this whole thing, right? Because even all of those stories you just mentioned, these have been many months back, right? So this was when literally the company was 10 people mm -hmm. or like whatever, maybe 15 people, right? In a small town in Erlangen in, in, in Germany. So it was very early in the project. And of course, many things do not work. And I think the, the thing that certainly surprised us is how much attention even those like very, very early tests got. I think the thing that, does not surprise us is that it's obviously a very new idea and it will take a while for people to understand all of the implications of this and uh i think it will change quite quickly once we actually launch the mainnet and start onboarding a lot of people and people realize okay wow this actually is on track to be the biggest project in crypto yeah i mean if you look at the chart that um sam altman shared back in october october 21st Yep. You have uh, a pretty quick ramp in just six months to 100,000 people getting scanned. And it was operators, I guess you call them operators, these folks who are right. taking the orbs out and from Chile to Indonesia to Norway, France, Zimbabwe, Indonesia, Kenya, India, just um, different operators going out and getting students on board. And people want to do this. People want to be involved in crypto. So, right. and the operators have figured out a way to get people out there and it's right. and actually those numbers got much better since then, by the way, uh, um, which is, which where is are you at cool. now? So, What's the total number? So, so the, you have the, the first, really, yeah, this doesn't count the first quarter of this year. Yeah. yeah. So the, the thing we look at internally is how many, how many signups does one orb do on average a week, mm -hmm. right? Because then you can do, then you can do simple math. So right now, one is around between 700 and 800 a week. On average, the best ones do more than 2,000 a week. So wow. So even at 1,000 a week, 1,000 a week, that means an orb can do 50,000 a year, and you're doing 50,000 orbs. Right. And 50,000 will only be the first year. So like basically, how the production ramp up works this year, end of this year, it will be 6,800. Next year, it will be, well, 50,000 plus 6,800. So we basically hit... Uh, full production scale in November, mid November. I mean, even at 50,000 orbs doing 50, just a thousand a week. Yeah, that's 700,000 a year. That means 10 years you have everybody on the planet. It should, it actually can go much quicker than that. But yeah, yeah. no, I'm just, if you got yeah. to 500, if you, 
I mean, if you did 500,000 orbs, um, you would, yeah, be, you'd be able to get there a lot quicker, right? Well, basically, if, if we stay, all of this sounds crazy. I know that part. And let's see. Uh, certainly all kind of saturation effects will kick in and, and what's not. But just following the production schedule multiplied by the numbers we measure right now, there's actually a path to onboard a billion people in less than two years, mm. which would be significant. Um, is is WorldCoin, it's a .org, is it a for-profit company? Well, it will be a decentralized organization, right? So uh -huh. kind of this whole idea of a company uh, will will not exist, hopefully, um, kind of a, as soon as as even possible. So it will be first all the all the IP will move to a, a foundation, um, and then it will be what people call a DAO. However, we really need to figure out what this really means in practice. But um, all of this technology will be open sourced, and people will be able to build things with that. So. And instead of getting shares in a company that IPOs, everybody who you participates get tokens, will right. get tokens. So if you're the CEO or the founder or Sam could have, you know, whatever, a million tokens, if they become worth 10,000 each, you make $10 million. If they become worth a dollar each, you made a million dollars or whatever you pay right. for it. So, so, so that, is the, that is the really important and I think also really exciting and cool part is that all incentives of users, investors, founders, all of them are aligned around this one single thing, which is the token. Mm. And that's also how we structure the whole organization, how we structure uh, all, all of the fundraisers. Everyone is around, aligned around this token. And if the, if the project works, uh, the token will increase in value at some point. And it's a utility it, token, not a security. Right. But uh, you're only taking accredited investors into the project, so you don't have to deal with securities issues, I would assume, early on. That is, I mean, that is the main reason. I think yeah. there are many other reasons why you want to work with some of the best investors of the world Makes um sense. yeah right how will the this is sort of a dumb question maybe but if it's all going to be open sourced and then become a DAO, how will the investors and founders make money is it because you'll own most of or a bit significant chunk of the tokens right you you own those tokens uh, more and more people will start using this whole protocol and so the demand for the token will increase the price will need to increase as a consequence and that's how us and well, the I think users, you said earlier you had 20 percent of the tokens would be going to fund the project and fund the project means the investors and the founders and the employees 10 percent goes to the foundation 10 percent goes to investors pretty right. much and the that's founders that's would be a part of the investor pool i would assume that founders point. are part of the foundation pool so like oh the foundation pool got it okay foundation pool right got it awesome uh this is the brave new world instead of stock options you get tokens and if they appreciate, they appreciate that it. If is, they don't, that, that is the new thing. And then do though, do you, do they have, do the people who are the insiders of the tokens, do they have to hold them for a certain period of time? Do they have a lockup? Yes. Because yeah. Yes. And then how does that work? They can sell them over some period of time, 10% a year. How do you, how do you mitigate that? Because we have securities law. And so with this new token uh, economy that's occurring in parallel right. to securities law, we have, hey, you can sell in secondary as a private company, no problem. But when you become a public company, you have to file, you have to, you know, sell them over some period of time. There's some regulations. What, what is the right, best practice I, in a private token sale? Basically, you just have a quite aggressive and long full lockup and then a linear, a linear, a linear unlock schedule over two years. Mm, got it. So you're locked up for some number of years, five years, 10 years, right. and then you can sell? No, it's less than that. I, yeah. I, I don't want to comment on Yeah, like, well, what's the best practice in the industry? Lock up for a year or two and then you could sell? Yeah, all? lock up for a year or two and then linear, linear unlock over two years. So you don't have like Got those it. supply shocks in the market. Got it. Yeah, I mean, that's, I mean, people have been pretty clear that's what happened with Solana and other breakout projects was that the insiders who bought these tokens had to sell them over her time. If not, somebody clears the whole position in an early position, it could tank the whole thing. Right, um, right. Which is what happens with lockups for employees and early investors and anything. Well, this is fascinating. Uh, continued success with it. When will people in America be scanning their irises? When will people see this at their farmer's market or university? Mm -hmm. or, as soon as Jason you know. gets the orb. Just, yeah, you know. I, I'm not going out and orbing people. It's a little too <laughs> sci-fi for me, but <laughs> I would certainly create a wallet. I don't have a problem with it. It seems like, yeah, I mean, I, th I think the government and Visa have a lot more information on me. Apple has a lot more information on me with my phone. Right. And where I am and Chrome with my search history and like feels like other my ISP feels like a lot of people have a lot more information on me. Although a biometric does feel scary 
in this case it's it's because it's hashed i think it's less of an issue so when will so, we uh, when do people in america start getting scanned well america is actually mass? america is actually an interesting one um because as you probably know with crypto there's a lot of regulatory uncertainty i think mm -hmm. is a good way to frame it so you really do not know as a as a project and as a founder mm. what are the exact rules i need to follow mm. um to, to launch in that country so basically we will make america the last. <laughs> right we will make the identity piece um accessible quite quite soon um like there will be again beta betas for uh for developers really really soon uh but then when but the free token tokens launches, like even giving free tokens in america lawyers are going to be like uh right. not clear let's see how not clear let's, <laughs> let, let's see how that plays out that's right yeah well i mean this is i mean i think something I, I don't know how you feel about as a crypto person but america really needs to catch up here and make the rules of the road be super amazing. clear <laughs> because yeah. you have all these american investors who want to pile in and then we we here in the you know people who are investing in private company world have to play by all these crazy rules and i don't want to say crazy but we have a regulatory framework that is yep. intense um, and detailed and expensive. And then crypto has a very fluid one. And by all accounts, it's, you know, innovation and money's moving very quickly in the crypto space yep. and very slowly in the startup private space. Entrepreneurs are clearly voting with their time to do this more fluid one and do it outside the United States. Right. No, no, I think I think you're exactly right. Uh, the Many of the best, the world's best investors are here. Many of the, of the of the smartest kind of people, developers are here. So it would be, I think the US really needs to kind of accelerate this whole uh, thinking framework around crypto and Web3 and make it much more easy for projects. Well, and then and they have founders. to, the complication, of course, is, well, then what do you do with existing securities law? And I, you know, I, the framework I liked was, uh, or the framework I came up with, so I like it <laughs> by default, is maybe just scaling the regulation to the size of the project so if you're doing you know a 10 million dollar crypto project you know you can do 10 million dollars file one piece of paperwork as an experimental project and don't take more than a thousand dollars from a thousand people whatever the math is you know you can take huh. a th up to a thousand from ten thousand people okay now you want to do a hundred million dollar project you gotta file like you know 10 pages of paperwork and you have to know anybody who does over ten thousand but anybody under ten thousand dollars you don't have to KYC them or whatever, and it's a little more fluid, right? You come up with some system that is, you know, matches the potential downside or fraud or risk profile. I mean, this is the part I really do not know how to solve it the best. I'm a physicist, not a lawyer, so I don't, I don't <laughs> know that part really well. But. Well, okay. Yeah. The lawyers always get paid is the one rule I found. And the more complicated, the more they get paid. So All right. more complexity seems to be what will happen. Uh, Right. Well, appreciate so, you coming on. Anything else, yeah. Molly, you have that you wanted to touch well, I, on? I guess on that regulation question, is that part of the reason that the tests and the beta period rolled out? It, it certainly yes in Norway, but also in, you know, what might be considered developed countries where penetration, like crypto penetration and knowledge is pretty low. Like there is still that sort of outstanding question of why start in these countries where people may not have known what they were signing up for? I mean, to be honest, this this was actually like this one part I really did not like appreciate about all of those reports is yeah. because the simple answer is just no. Like we launched quite equally across like we have been in Germany, we have been in in, in, in France, in Norway, in in Spain, right? Like but not the US. That that's that that's right. Um and also Indonesia and Kenya, right? Because the whole idea is to make it accessible all over the world. And then you also you should not shy away from Indonesia uh, and, and just start in Norway where it's easy. So you really have yeah. to also start where it's hard. Why do you have to start where it's hard? If all you're doing is like gathering hashes to train a network to recognize hashes. Oh, because, because you really need to understand how you, how you build your product. So also people that do not live in Norway, but live somewhere else actually understand it, actually know what's, well, what is going on. Got it. You want to solve for hard. It, not just the layups, right? Because right. you you right. want it to be a world coin, not a that's exactly right. Yeah, EU I mean, coin or a for example, if you really coin. Would, <laughs> right, if you would only launch in whatever Europe, you you could do KYC. Everyone here has passports, right? This is this mm -hmm. is the easy part. Uh, but if you really want to make it accessible for everyone, you have to do new things and you have to really do things that are much harder. And 
certainly the most interesting crypto project i think <laughs> it's definitely on my list of the top five most intriguing thank you so much jason yeah, yeah thank we you wish so you continued success that with it and true. um it's uh we're going to be watching uh it's it's really fascinating and i um, interested to see where you take it uh, so continue success thank you, and thank you for coming on the program hey everyone producer nick here I want to tell you about the SaaS syndicate. If you're a founder of a SaaS company with a product and market, our investment team wants to talk to you. Head over to thesyndicate.com slash SaaS, S-A-A-S, to apply to raise from the SaaS syndicate. And you can join Jason's syndicate of over 9,000 accredited investors at thesyndicate.com. Producer Justin here. No cool startup? Check out OpenScouting.com, where anyone can refer a startup to our investment team here at launch. Even if you don't know the founder, if you're the first to flag a company for us and we decide to invest, you'll get 5K in cash or 10% of our carry. Hey everybody, producer Rachel here. Are you an early stage startup that has product and market, some traction, and are looking to raise at least $500,000? Apply today to Remote Demo Day for your chance to pitch to over 9,000 investors in Jason's syndicate. Submit your application at Remote Demo Day com. Our next event is on April 27th. And if you want to learn how to invest in startups from the world's greatest angel investor, and no, we're not talking about Chris Saka, then head to angel.university to apply. The four-hour workshop costs $300 and all proceeds are donated to charity. To date, we've donated over $175,000 to various charities, and you can see the full list at angel.university slash charity. 